Hey everybody, Jason here. I just want to mention that the conversation you're about to hear is pretty free-flowing. We talk chain mail in the beginning, then we get into world building, and then we get back into talking about chain mail. We talk about large-scale combat and scaling it up and down to the needs of the group. Uh, so it goes all over the place. So if, if, if you're at a section that you're like, eh, I'm not super interested in this part, just wait a couple minutes and it's going to change. No sunlight or pillars Seeds of pain and more pause Does it talk? Does it know how? Does it bottle dust anyhow? Let on the street the gore And we'll show them so much more We'll leave your brains at the Welcome back to Cerebervore. I'm Jason. I do the Nerds RPG Variety Cast. And today we're going to revisit a topic. One of our most popular episodes is our Chain Mail with OD&D episode with Daniel of Bandits Keep Media Empire and Taylor of the Cleric Square Ringmail Empire. I have these two joining me once more to continue that conversation. How are you gentlemen doing today? I'm doing well. I am doing all right either, but I try not to focus too hard on it. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> right. No reason to tamper with success, right? Yeah, exactly. No reason. Now, I do have a bit of a surprise for you, Jason. So because, as most of your listeners know, this is the, the – Jason is the host of – Nerds Variety Cast, and it would not be complete if we did not have at least one surprise unboxing. Oh, here we go. What do we got hey. here? So I've got Excellent. a. So yeah, Jason did not see this coming. It is a surprise. So I've got a parcel here. It is, uh, let's see. Yep, there's the audio only folks, but he's holding a box in front of us. The height is approximately one Sharpie and half a cap. Excellent. The width is. Uh, my electric bill across. There we go. And <laughs> the de uh, let's see, and uh, square footage on the bottom is proportional. Uh, let's see, I don't have a frame of reference there, so maybe about a face, about a face width across for my fat head. So yep. excellent measuring. Yep, uh, I know. I know everybody expects that, so we'll go ahead and uh, cut that open there. Um, mm -hmm. That may not have sounded much like scissors, but that's okay. It's called visual. It's called audio effects. So, what is in this box here? Let's see. Oh, it looks like I have a T-shirt. This is oh. the black and white uh, uh, old school essentials retro adventure T-shirt with the awesome wizard on it. So, this box is Very the fancy. fulfillment. Yeah, this box is the fulfillment of the old school essentials. Kickstarter. So um, I'm excited about it. Um, I got a couple things from there. I had been playing and, and more, more appropriately, I know uh, Jason, you are a huge and Daniel too. You guys are a huge fan of this retro clone version. Uh, it's much better than the BX uh, original booklets. I know you guys have gone on record with that. So I've got, uh, yeah. So I, I did, I did go in the, though the real reason I went into this is uh, the the boxing quality is uh, pretty nice. I I won't I won't go into it too, too deeply, but um, so I did I did I went in for the booklet sets. I figure I've been playing off of the SRD and old editions for or the 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 real BX long enough that I figured I could get I could cut Gavin a bone and uh, it wouldn't hurt to have the book and uh, referee screen. That is not made out of cereal boxes. Excellent. Yeah. So, so the truth is, OSC is an excellent product. Mm -hmm. Great production values, very well laid out. I per personally do prefer the art and some of the things in the original books, especially the play examples and things like that. But at no point do I ever want to besmirch OSC because I do think Gavin's put out a great product. And he's really revitalized you know, the market to some degree to the point where OSC is kind of the standard for OSR games. Now, now we see instead of OSR, we see OSC compatible stamped on yeah. games. Yeah. Yeah. And the thing with Gavin too, which is very cool. I don't know if you're part of this whole process was when he was first making it the BX essentials, he was in the BX group, 
like bouncing things off people who had played and he gave all the stuff away for free early on. So it's not like this is, I think people look at it and go, Oh, this is expensive. And this is just some company, but this is a guy that really, you know, likes BX. I mean, he's really, he's in it. I mean, to, so yeah. So yeah, I, I have nothing bad to say, but I also backed the Kickstarter more or less just to back it. I like, I already had OSC, but I backed it again because I wanted to support the the project. Cause I think more stuff for BX is better. I don't think I'll ever use the advanced stuff because I, I looked through it. And I didn't care for it personally for my table, but that's me now, you know, me in five years, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I did, I did save this box. It came in like a month mm-hmm. ago, but I wanted to save it for you guys. Cause uh, you know, I like, Excellent. I like giving my friends a hard time. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really And actually that GM screen is really nice. I, uh, mm-hmm. I, I have it, although I don't use it uh, in person. Uh, because I don't play BX in person, but I actually took the PDF of it that came with it and I like recut it into a giant JPEG and I use it as my wallpaper on my computer when I run so that I can have all the stuff, the charts and stuff right there on my wallpaper, which is really convenient. That is smart. Yeah. That's very, that's yeah. a, that's very smart by, by compared to printing it out and then taping it to the wall. <laughs> well, you're, you're old school, I guess. I. <laughs> right. So you, you are truly old school. There we go. So, so before we actually get into the conversation, I guess that spawns a question, Taylor. Do, do you plan on eventually evolving to a point where you're doing OSC plus chainmail? That is a good question. That is a very good question. So I had, uh, like I mentioned, I backed the Kickstarter because I most of the games I get to play in are uh, BX based, and having it as a reference was is a good is good um originally i'd wanted to run an osc advanced game just to see because i remember i had the advanced some of the stuff i was i like some of it more than others uh specifically the spell lists the extended spell lists and treasure items and i love that kind of supplement because mm-hmm. that's got it adds a whole bunch of stuff to your game and uh osc compatible you mentioned this this came up on a red caps episode not too long ago where that is a very good label uh, because it's defined, no one's fighting over it, and you know exactly what you're getting. So by comparison, if you say OSR, it means different things to different people. But if you say, this works in OSE, then that tells me, okay, I know I can play this in BX. I know that if I change this little thing, I can work it in Hyperborea. I can do this, and it'll play smoothly in DCC. So there's you, you know what you're getting, and so that's a very handy label. Hundred yeah, yeah, I agree. I, and, and I just also want to point out, so I don't, so it doesn't seem negative. I also backed it right around the same time. I think when the first OSC happened, the Advanced Labyrinth Lord, which is also very nice, and I didn't like the Advanced stuff. <laughs> I just, <laughs> I just don't like the Advanced stuff. So that's, it's not anything about the OSC's version of it. I'm just not mm. the Advanced things. I'm just not a fan of, except in Swords of Wizardry. That's the only place I ever use that stuff. So yeah, that's just me. Right. And to tie it to tie it back to the chainmail conversation, it's I think the advanced stuff kind of takes us a further step away from because uh, cha- chainmail is limited in terms of archetypes because mm-hmm. you have it's a war game. You have dude on field. You have the uh, Maiar wizard type. You have some mythical beings. And that's. But that's what you have, and there's a there's a little bit of there's a little bit of Tolkien influences, obviously, because that that's that that sold copies in in the 70s and, and today. Uh, I'm a, I enjoy Tolkien. I haven't gotten all of my books back, but I have a leather bound uh, spe- special book for for the Lord of the Rings. I have a okay. place in my heart for it. Um, gift from my uh, deceased mother. So that that in the Bible. So those are my two books that I try to keep on my desk. <laughs> <laughs> but, Makes sense. Um, yeah, that's a, that's really good. I was actually saying the other day I should reread the Lord of the Rings. I haven't read it in forever. I always get, you know, Fellowship. I love it. I get like halfway through Two Towers, mm-hmm. and my eyes just go cross-eyed, and then I end up not finishing oh, yeah. it. Yeah. It, it, it's two funny, that's just... where I get stuck as well. I get stuck during the journey when you get Sam and Frodo and Gollum, and, mm-hmm. and they're doing their. Mm-hmm. That's where I always get stuck. I'll I'll wait mm-hmm. a couple months. I do usually about every decade I read it, and um. Nice. Yeah, but that's where I always get stuck as well. Yeah, it's it's a lot slower in the middle. There's some there's some speculation about that regarding because that part of the book was written while his I think 
I need, I should Google this uh, before I say it, but I like, I like winging it. So the, I remember that was written during the height of the second world war. And so he had some other concerns weighing on him that uh, may have influenced the tone. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the return of the King, uh, easy to read for me, uh, fellowship of the ring, fun to read two towers. Do you have to work through it just a little bit? So yeah, I, I, yeah. Consistent, uh, consistent appeal. <laughs> Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and I, so, so on the chainmail thing, because uh, you were mentioning archetypes, it's funny. The other day, I was just sitting here, and I do this oftentimes. I walk around my house and talk to myself about what I should do. I was trying to convince myself to add a thief to the game, and I went around in circles for like forty-five minutes, and I could not find a good reason. And I have been on the record to say the thief is my favorite class in BX and AD and D. I can't figure out a way to add it to OD and D. I, I just, I don't see the point. It doesn't make, it does you don't need it. And it's it's so interesting. And that's why I feel about advanced classes. It's like, you want to be a paladin? Well, just be a lawful fighter and yep. do good deeds and we'll see where it goes. Like, I don't yep. need a class for that. And I think that's what I mean about the advanced stuff. Just kind of go in that direction. Yep. Yeah, exactly. It also makes, yeah. it also makes what's interesting here is that when, when you, this is where I said, I'm going to try a segue. Although if you say you're segueing, it's not very good, right? So I, I already blew it. But. <laughs> we'll get editors. So, so that the, the one, qu- the, the main question, I guess, that I wanted to, to talk about, or the issue, the thing that I'm bouncing off now is the is the scalability. So I've been running my game for thirty over thirty sessions, and when I got into this, right, and, I, and I've expounded about how I love the idea that like this makes fighters awesome because only fighters can do this and it's not. You do reach a point, especially if you're using, and you don't use this is why I think it's, I, at least as far as I know, um, where only the fighter can fight on fantasy combat. And honestly, as a hero, you're not that good at it. <laughs> so you reach this point where there's certain creatures that just you can't use because nobody can hit it. And then it, it starts to really limit the amount of creatures available to you unless you make some changes. So this is something that I've run into because you get your fourth level fighter, at that point, a cleric's fifth level, but they they can't fight as a hero. They're only they're like two levels away from that. Magic users way off from fighting as a hero. So you get your fighter, and they're fighting, let's say, a troll, right, or an ogre, right, which is is reasonable to, to beat. And they're the only one. Well, not an ogre, but a troll. Let's say that can only be fought on fantasy. They're the only ones that can fight it. So I found myself hesitating to use certain monsters for that reason. And this is one reason why I, I was thinking with the thing that you do with man to man is kind of brilliant because it seems like that's not really an issue, right? As long as they have enough hit dice, they could fight the troll. Is that the truth? Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And so I've been trying uh, my, my OD and D uh, clone campaign or chain mail campaign is a little more infancy. We, um, I ran into some personal struggles in October. And so I haven't been able to run these last couple months, but up until that point, we got about eight sessions in, uh, we had not gotten to the point where we were fighting, uh, troll type monsters yet, but we, we did get in and, uh, the, the party had encountered, a, or parties, I was trying to run it uh, interchangeable, so I, I didn't have a consistent group, but we had run into definitely multi-hit die creatures, and the same theory kind of applies, because a lot of the players were still level one, and when you have the, again, uh, I, I also have not implemented thieves. I've been playing with trying to figure out how to, well, I've been playing with how I want to implement uh, skill type activities. That is uh, a thing that you do that cannot be role played. So we're not going to like, just, just like you're not going to ask the players to stand up and punch each other to demonstrate their martial prowess in the combat scenario. You're not going to hand them a lock at the table and tell them to pick it to see if they could get through this door. Um, Right. Right. But uh, so how, how it's been going I did, I did that blog post that I promised in the last episode, and I then I went back and I re-clarified it, and I think I like where it is. I'm consistently tempted to go back to fistful of D20s, but I actually do, do kind of like the, the single throw. And so as a high-level backing, you make your attack, and based on uh, weapon versus armor, it determines the target number you need to hit. Then additionally, on top of that, you have the ability to allocate a number of your attacks towards your attacks as part of your declared action. So if I am level four, or if I'm a four hit hit die fighter, and I've got a two hit die uh, 
thief <laughs> next to me, then we will we if we both hit, we'd be able to accomplish six hit die worth of uh, damage, so to speak. And the players initial the players kind of got into it. Uh, some of them some of them preferred the hit point abstraction. Some of them kind of dove right in, and others it took them a bit. And I think one of my favorite uh, comments that was made to that end was that you begin to separate the concept of your fights, your, your, uh, your fighting capability, the man equivalence that's presented by your hit dice. You separate that from the actual number of attacks you make. So in, ma in, in, mass, in mass combat or in troop combat, you come in as uh, I fight as superhero so I can swing and potentially take down eight mooks. Uh, you separate that from the thinking. And so while yes, you are death dealer in fire and ice kind of chopping his way through the minions of Necron, the ice wizard, but then the, when you come into contact with that heroic foe, you, you're not making eight chopping attempts at the, uh, at the monster. Or if a dragon comes at you who has a lar who fights his four to six cavalry, he's not making four to six attacks and you're blocking the first three. It's more about the implied ability of the adversary to connect, to do damage. And, and so it becomes uh, the dragon swipes his tail across the floor and knocks a few guys over. So he doesn't make four attacks. He just, in this movement, he, he makes four, four casualties worth. Uh, similarly, right. they, they, he may reach down. You have that scene from, was it 97? Uh, the, that uh, reign of fire where mm -hmm. uh, dragons took over the, yeah. Yeah, and so you have that beautiful scene, a little spoiler alert, where the guy jumps out of the castle with an axe and then just gets chomped. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it, it was 2002, actually. 2002. But, but, but the right movie, definitely. The, yep. Yeah, Christian Bale, Matthew McConaughey. Yeah, you got so the this right is, movie. Yeah. This is perfect because this is my second thing that I was thinking of. So this is good. So on one level, I like this, right? I'm like, okay, that's great because now I don't have to worry about, well, my fighter's a hero, you're this, only the fighter can fight the troll. Uh, but then the troll is fighting his six men. So now I've got the equivalent of, let's say, five men in the entire party. The troll makes one successful hit. They party wipe. Or does the troll have to attack one person at a time, taking each one out one by one? Like, how would that work? Would they distribute? Like, how are you, how are you handling that? I mean, I know how I, I got some ideas how I would do it. Maybe you would say, I'm going to allocate this many, which is, I guess, is what, what you're probably going to say. Uh, but, I, but I wonder that how does the troll know how many hit die the, the monster is? Like, how does that work in abstraction? So do you tell right. the player characters, these guys are only two hit dice, so you shouldn't put all your power into it? Or like, how does that work? Or how would do you think it would work at the table? Because I'm, I'm super curious about it. And, and I kind of want to wrap up. Uh, we'll go back to man-to-man -man in a second how I'm doing it, because I had a massive man-to-man -man combat. So I, it'd be, be fun to kind of talk about that a little bit. But I'm curious about that as well. Right. So to answer that, I am working on a. Uh, I'm, I'm working on for the new year uh, when when the whole holiday season and I have a little bit uh, kind of wraps up and I have a little more time. I'm working. Uh, some of my players have expressed interest in doing a, an arena series where I hand them essentially pregens or give or say, "Hey, build me a dude." I say, "Build." It's it's uh, OD and D compatible. It's like, okay, I, I have two hit dice. <laughs> That's your build. Right. That's how you build it. Right. <laughs> I picked a I picked a halberd. Okay, build complete. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, but yeah. So they they've had some interest in um, doing arenas. So maybe uh, it, a typical delve that we've been playing that we've been running will be between uh, three to six hours. So between uh, when we feel like we've hit a point where the party's like we're good, let's back off, or when we, we're all about to fall asleep on the table. And so this next idea would be, let's focus on this little combat system. There is a place in my home campaign setting called the arena. And uh, so it makes sense to have sort of uh, gladiatorial bouts there. And so maybe that would be, the, we're going to use that as a way to experiment. So the original idea was that you would allocate hits based on individuals, but I thought about that, and if the if the idea is to try to 
expedite the process. If the idea is to try to make it flow more smoothly at the table, rolling 2d6 over and over and over again is not going to do that. That's going to slow down the game. And so what I started to try, what I started to try to do was the secondary idea is if I make an attack, I declare the attack versus a uh, grouping. Uh, and that works in enemies because I can control the defense type of the enemy. So if I, if I uh, say in, in one of my more uh, recent, uh, uh, in one of my more recent sessions uh, that we got to play in, the recurring theme were these kind of bizarre uh, Dagon style cult cultists types. And so I know what their defense is always going to be. And so if I if the fighter comes in as uh, fighting as a, as a hero, he can roll to hit against leather. And then all of a sudden, the um, he can knock four of them off the table at the same time. That's one roll, and you cut through four uh, one-hit die dudes. Uh, at the same time, though, I hadn't... Uh, that that would cut both ways because like like you were saying if i have a six hit die troll encounter four or five individuals and he rolls to hit once does he wipe six dudes off the table and so that's a that's a very big that'd be a very very big thing and so off the initial in the initial implementation when i was talking about doing it one at a time or allocating one at a time then that kind of uh, my answer from then would have been, well, use uh, use troop combat, have him roll 66, and then for each six, uh, take a guy off the table. But uh, now that we're thinking about it, I, the uh, the idea of that that may actually be that may actually be the way I do it for NPCs, because because as a player, it, it's a little easier. You can allocate X number of hits towards different. Uh, uh, different troop types, but mm -hmm. as a as a ref, it's it's going to be mixed. It's always going to be mixed. Now, there's right. the we my party has been very cool about bringing in hirelings. They figured out very early on trying to hire specialists, trying to hire mercenaries, and they actually managed to talk their way into bringing a cleric along to one of them. They in, they endeared themselves to one of the temples and convinced the. Uh, convinced one of the uh, ac uh, one of the acolytes to come with them so they were able to bring along an, an npc specialist which they paid for in shares rather than monies but they which hefty hefty price but worth it because uh, you because you, you get the uh, the benefit of the of the of the leveled npc but the uh where i was eventually going with that is it it might be more feasible than i think and I and I think that it's a good idea to so I've got the idea in mind that I would pro, that I would prefer to reduce the number of roles, but I also want to play it. I want to try it, and I want to put it on the table and make sure that uh, it's not uh, Taylor theory craft and it, it's backed by <laughs> something smart. Yeah, no, it definitely it, it it like in the last conversation it really piqued my interest because it that is one of the problems I'm having. Like for instance, you have a troll, and the troll is attacking your fighter in plate mail, your thief in leather, thief, right? And your magic user in no armor, right? So if they are just making one attack roll, let's say, who do they attack, right? I have this problem, I actually have problem, this problem even in trip combat, because it's like, well, because sometimes it shuffles the number of dice you roll, not just the number you need on it. So there, you know, obviously in chain mail, that didn't happen, right? It's like your light troops hit your heavy troops and that was the fight. But when you're talking man-to-man, -man, which is, I guess, why man-to-man's invented, right? <laughs> you, you have this mixed armor, and honestly, I didn't. And I think I talked about this before. I, I didn't. I didn't use man to man enough at the beginning because I was really trying to get troop down because it, it's it's the easy one. Really, it's so fun to throw a handful of d sixes. But man to man becomes so much more important with the PCs because of that, right? And, and of course, I don't use monsters. I haven't added this yet where the monsters claws equal or sword or whatever the stuff you're doing. So that just leaves me with troop or fantasy, and that's where I'm hitting the wall. So like for me, I'm trying to work out what I'm actually my plan right now is which seems the opposite of what I just said is to actually make some creatures even harder to fight. Like some creatures can only be fought on fantasy and they will usually have some special weakness. So in the case of a troll, a troll can be fought on fantasy combat only or with fire. If you use fire against a troll, a peasant could kill it, but they're not going to be able to kill it because the troll is going to be so tough that, you know, it would take 10 peasants to all hit at once. Right. But if I make that a single die roll, they could kill the troll. And this is where I think throwing multiple dice uh, works there. But again, I'm trying it too. So that's why I love this like back and forth because I'm with you. I love the idea of being like, 
I roll one die, I kill 10 guys. But at the same time, if that can, if that's, you know, if, if that good works deuce, the other way, right, yeah. <laughs> right that, that might be a problem. So yeah, I, I think it's super interesting. And so anyways, with man to man, I want to mention that. So we played a man to man combat and it was funny because we really hadn't. And this is the first time they really ran into a bunch of people. They both have been fighting monsters. Like it just happens to work out that way or large groups. So if I, if, if I, if the bad guys outnumber the good guys three to one, I always use troop no matter what. That's just how I do it. That's just kind of a baseline. And it always was that way, right? They were fighting a lot of orcs. You know, they're fighting 20 orcs, right? There's five of them. So you always use troop. In this case, they were uh, fighting off against leveled NPCs, like level two and three uh, clerics and stuff. So we went into man to man and it was a, it was intense <laughs> to, to say the least. And what I found was at the end, I actually asked them, I'm like, I wonder if the hit points is too much of a pain in the butt. And weirdly, they actually liked the hit points. They were like, no, I like that this is different. And now my character is injured and like it has a different feel. So I'm leaving them for now for that. But uh, but what did happen, which I think is interesting, is that I was wondering at a certain point, I was like, well, hold on, you can fight as a hero. This guy can fight as a superhero, or whatever they were. Should we use fantasy? And what I've come up with is the idea that heroes and superheroes do not fight each other on fantasy combat because it's never beneficial, actually. When you start looking at it, it's almost never for their amusing man to man. So it's funny how you work through these things. I just thought it was an interesting, like, it played out differently than I thought. That's why it ties into what you're saying. Because like once you get to the table and you see what people do with it, you're like, oh, that's not at all what I thought was going to happen there. And it's really fascinating to get into that part of the the design of it, you know? Yep. A lot of fun. The play, play testing is is definitely the, the fun part. And a lot of a lot of folks get in trouble uh, doing stuff for the trying to homebrew stuff. Before. And, and I think I've, I've gone off on tangents like this before, but it's, that's why it's important to play the game mm-hmm. before, uh, before, during, and after uh, changing the game. Cause you get, you get a feel for what, for what's going on. And- yeah. 100%. I mean, I, I, I did like tons and tons of just little one shots and combats just with one player to try all the stuff, make sure it all works. Cause you, you don't want to get to the table and have it be a mess. And like I say, as much as I love fantasy combat, I love the idea of, mm-hmm the the you don't have to care about the weapons you, you know because this is this is conan fighting the demon it's 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 going to become more and more specialized i think because mm-hmm. i feel like that's what it should be it is conan bare hands against the demon right it's not a party fighting a troll or maybe it would be but if it's a mm-hmm. if it's three hearts and three lions troll it definitely is because <laughs> yeah. that troll is not so the other question i have since trolls are on my mind is in your system how would you handle or do you just not use it regeneration right because it's all or nothing right so how does that work so in lieu of hit points, uh, I have started, uh, I have an injury table that I use, and this actually came up because there's another good question. If I'm not using hit points, how does cure spell work? How does cure wounds work? And so the wound table that I have, I think I, I think it posted it on the blog at one point, but it's got, uh, you can, uh, it's fairly straightforward. You can reduce your fighting capability you can reduce your movement or i think it can damage an ability score i'm just trying to remember offhand those are those yeah. are things that can happen now you can just die outright too that can happen but uh or you can uh you can get into a point where you're bleeding out and you have to be taken to take into account for that so the direct answer how does the regeneration work when you inflict an injury it happens but then every X number of rounds, uh, or I may, I may lock it behind a die roll to give it some uh, to give it some variability. But every X number of rounds, the severity of the injury improves. So say so say I had because each of them I think has three levels. Because I was I was very proud of myself. It's it's a D12 that you roll for a player and a D8 that you roll for a non-player. The first eight results hit things that everybody has, and then the last couple results only hit player characters. Because why would I? Because uh, enemies don't need stats until they need them. But right. then the so I was, I was particularly pleased with myself for that. <laughs> yeah. No, that's actually really smart because when you said ability scores, I was going to actually ask you what what's what's a troll's ability score? Do you roll it up? But yep. there you go. Okay. Nope, I do not. And so yeah, and sense. yeah, and so the the to go to with three hearts and three lions. Uh, uh, again, this this is a bit of a spoiler uh, for a <laughs> book that everyone knows how it ends, even if they haven't read it because they played D anD D. But the what happens is the party 
attacks the troll. They're able to wound it. They're able to hurt it, but it just it just laughs at them and regenerates. And the there's a scene the, where they lop off a hand, and the hand crawls back and reattaches itself to the troll. And they find out almost by accident when the Swan May hits it with the torch that she hits it in a place where it's been wounded and the, and the wound cauterizes, it doesn't heal. And so, and th at that point, the troll starts showing fear. It realizes it's been, uh, I don't, it, there's, it, there's, it's not clear if it knew about its own weakness or if it just is like, uh oh, this is, uh, this is different than what I would expect. And so they then proceed in a very Hercules versus the Hydra uh, scene to injure the troll and cauterize the wound to try to make these things stay. And so in the same, in the same vein, the way that the way that I've been treating the combat system is if I'm able to hit the troll, then I roll on this injury table. And one of the options is to lose the, uh, I think that I, th so say I, I take a 90 foot movement penalty or a nine inch movement penalty because, uh, mm then if I don't prevent the regeneration, then next round that reduces to a six inch movement penalty, next round, three inch, next round, he's all better. In, in the same sense, the uh, uh, cure, cure spell, we had a player take one to the chest and he went down and was immobilized. He lost his ability to move entirely. And so the cure spell removed that condition, moving him back up. And so he was still Encumber, he, he was still less capable than he was before, but they it removed this condition and replaced it with something that was more favorable. And so the the cure spell works the same way. It shifts it shifts your injury in a direction that's more favorable to you with higher leveled cure spells shifting it more steps in that direction. And oh, so, very cool. Yep. And so to, so to you take an back, injury oh, when they sorry just so I'm clear on that. So when you let's say the troll six dice. You, you when you do six hit dice worth of damage, it takes an injury. It doesn't die. Correct. It takes an okay. injury, and, and then one of those back, injuries yeah. might be death. Yeah. Okay. Correct. For non-player, for non-players, death is 50-50. So, mm -hmm. uh, the, but it, it it also deter. It's also. I think if I remember the, the chart correctly, it's over there. Uh, I moved uh, the, 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 the listeners the can't, it is. The listeners can't see this, but I moved the furniture around a little bit. And so uh, Jason and Daniel are looking at my very, uh, very nice looking, but secretly cheap mahogany desk here uh, and with a beautiful uh, miniatures case on the top of it. But and I have my, my table that's taped to the far wall. But if I remember correctly on a one, it's, outright it's outright you're you've lopped the head off uh you've hit a, something vital and instant instant down instant kill on a two you have a number of rounds to stabilize on a three you have a number of like minutes or something like that and or and it and so and then so it, it's there it's un it's unlikely to die straight off but it's 50 50 that you have inflicted a fatal wound uh to an npc uh, this came up in a pretty, in a, a very, fairly early on, and I, I liked how this played out. The one of the players got a fatal result, but he got it over the course of turns, uh, and so he had like forty minutes before he he didn't know. We I rolled it in secret. I just but uh, and then, then he opted to stay back and hold off a horde of undead, just kind of planting himself in a hallway and fighting them and keeping them at bay for the rest of his party nice. members to escape. That was a very heroic last stand. And it would, uh, it was, it was, it was fun to narrate. It was fun to play. And um, I got to prove that I'm not a softy DM after all, <laughs> but yeah, it was, yeah. so that went about as well as I could have expected. And, um, but yeah, so, and that to, to mention, does the troll kill six players in one go? Maybe. So the players would roll six injuries in one roll. Okay. So he, he, he would probably kill a third of them uh, in one row and the others would have something else going on. And, it, and the severity is, is dependent to on a saving, uh, a saving throw to which the player characters are entitled. And, and so it's, uh, it's, it's all out on the blog. I have the, I never did, 
put the PDF up on uh, drive through I said I was going to try to do that. I never did, uh, but it's free on the blog. Uh, I'll, Jason, I'll send you a link to it. I, I'll try to upload a newer version. Uh, I've been playing with uh, different races. So I'm, I'm trying to replace the classic species in nice. the... Uh, in the game with something more thematic. I did a poll on the CWR Discord. Encourage anybody listening to join. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, running the game. Talk a, talk a lot about chainmail and, and war gaming in general comes up, and it's it's a nice little tight community. Uh, but uh, we were. I did a poll and said, what what should I write? Because uh, recently, as I think uh, Dan, I think Daniel, you you will have seen this. The fantasy medieval campaigns. Mm -hmm. by Marcia B. I think uh, uh, is, is her name came out and I downloaded that and I'm, I was excited about it. It's not exactly how I would have written it. Uh, it made me want to write my own, <laughs> but, that's, <laughs> but that's, that's the way, that's the kind of reaction you want to get. And so a lot of people who are into the role play aspect of it really loved it because it helped them jive with, because it reorganized the rules. It included chain mail in a way that was a comprehensible. And then, so a lot of the role players were really into it. And then a lot of my wargaming buddies were like, and eh, well, it doesn't have the rules for fatigue. It doesn't do this. Da, da, da. It, it's, and so, so there was kind of division on whether we liked it or not, but I downloaded it and mm -hmm. I liked, I liked some of the presentation. I haven't done, like I told them, I haven't done the, Fat, uh, the number checking to see if the they're all straight up, but it's a it's a great little reference tome, so to speak. And uh, I think I'm, I'll probably print print one out just to staple staple it to the wall. Um, and I've totally forgotten where I was going with this story. But oh, yeah. now I remember because I said, "What should no. I write? Should I oh. write the? Uh, should I cleave closely to?" OD and D and just replace the bits with chain mail and make it into a solid system. And the, the consensus on the discord was no lean in to the setting. Everybody was really enjoying the, uh, theme, uh, the tone, the atmosphere that I was putting into the games we were playing together. And they said, lean into that. That's what'll make it special. Cause, uh, we, one of the, one of the perennial things that comes up on, on our, uh, conversations is world Varus. World of Eris is not in and of itself a complete game, but in it's it's not it's truthfully I think it's like sixty pages, um, and it's and uh, it's great. It's it's so much flavor, so much uh, history, so much setting, and you it, it will inspire you uh, to to run for years out of these sixty pages, and so that and and seven voyages uh they both yeah. need, they they have the od and d mechanics but they lean very heavily into a tone into a theme and into an intended experience and so that's what they that's what my my uh, my gaming group was telling me is lean into that experience and so so that's what i started to do i'm trying to i'm trying yeah. to lean into it and keeping the mechanics tight keeping the fidelity so that we can benefit from that backwards compatibility but at the same time trying to produce something that we want that that stands out why why does why does this need to exist and uh, and give it give it some flavor no that's a really good uh question too because i think i even talked about this one before where I like as much as I love retro clones, it's like so many of them are just literally the same game, just rewritten yeah. with like two extra rules. And if you take it and you actually put flavor into it, then that makes it worthwhile, right? Because you're not, you know, you're not like just buying it because it has OD and Chamber, you're buying it because or or whatever, we're playing it because it's this world, which is interesting. Uh, do you know what races you're going to do or species? I do. So we have, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sticking with races because I want to leave it vague as to whether they enter interbreed. And uh, so I'm, I'm the, the setting is based in heavily off of a uh, old, uh, almost pre old Testament bronze age. Um, nice. And so I've got, so a uh, slightly sneak preview. We have our, my old, the, the existing races everybody knows about are obviously human. They are uh, Canish, which are based off of uh, Phoenician and Carthage, uh, with a lot of infusion from uh, 
the bad guys <laughs> of the Old Testament, and they're they're being portrayed as they because they're really fascinating historically. They're very fascinating people, and we just don't know that much about them. They were very uh, sparsely populated. They they didn't do the big cities that you see in Ur or Babylon, and they they because they were a trade network. They moved around, and Carthage effectively is the source of information we have on a lot of their culture. But that's also very Carthaginian. It's it's very tie. It's it, that's Iron Age at that point, right. and so they, they've evolved their own their own thing. So I have the the Canish, who are this seafaring skill based people. Uh, then you have the uh, the Bushelanders, which is kind of which is kind of an inside joke. <laughs> we back in um, eight bit theater days, there the the. I think the Final Fantasy the land was Corneria, and the joke was that's where the Corneers grew. And so I had a I had a country north of mine called Wheat Bushel Land uh, as as a reference. And so then the the name Bushel Lander just stuck. And so now they're they're the they're this kind of uh, European amalgam. Uh, the what do Bronze Age Europeans look like uh, coming into the Levant? And then we also have the the Demotic. Uh, not demonic, demotic, which is based off of uh, the Nile Valley, and that's based off of linguistics. Uh, I forget the the exact history of it, but I know this is this is an RPG podcast, not a uh, crypto linguistics podcast. But it's based off of the ling- the the language groups of early Egyptians, and so on. So I have those three. Those are human. They all level the same, so to speak. They all they're all they all they're all the same template. But then on top of that. I leaned into, I had a, had a, I'm trying to introduce a race called the Anak, and uh, it's linguistically based out of Egyptian, but it was a reference that was made to giants. So you, the the Raphaim of the Old Testament, uh, the Goliath, uh, for for folks who don't listen to the same podcast, or don't listen to the same uh, strange religious podcast I do, but the uh, the, the Goliath type people and there's there's stories in the Old Testament. So they, I think David goes into a village and and uh, does battle with a group of giants, the last of the this clan of the descendants of the Nephilim. And so, but there are references to these people in the Egyptian lore. And so, is it uh, not going? We're not going to worry about is it actually angels coming down and having babies with humans? It's more uh, or, or, or whether these people are, you know, pituitary giants, but the, uh, or, or, or where are they from? Uh, are they are they just from a different part of the Mediterranean where people were naturally just taller? But no, these are based off of the mythic creatures. So I'm trying to, uh, they were portrayed in the Egyptian sources as being uh, wise in the ways of science, as being philosophers, but as also being strong warriors, which how much of this is true uh, versus how much of it is fabricated over over time, and then how much of this is gameable. Uh, do, I, uh, and do, do I make this blatantly OP class? <laughs> uh, and then, uh, so elf. what I'm doing, yeah, elf. Uh-huh. So, and then we had so yeah they they have uh you they have strict stat requisites I figured I I went with them sort of the mm-hmm. way and uh, I'm sticking to uh, race as class for the most part because mm-hmm. when you don't have uh, when you don't have the 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 other archetypes and I'm still figuring out how to do this with with magic users and clerics but we'll we'll save that for round three but the uh, so they they have strict stat requirements. They have an improved fighting capability. They start they start off fighting as two men. Uh, I think that's fitting with the fiction. But then they also level more slowly, and then they cap out uh, earlier. So a human uh, a human may or a a bushelander or a canish may be able to fight better than they can at the ten or the the hundred thousand experience mark, uh, but. And until they may they they get they have to get to that heroic tier before they hit the parity, and I think that fits the myths that fits the literature, and that was one of the things I think that we we had talked about last time we had a chance to chat is literature and the one of the challenges of uh, expanding the fantasy combat table that that I felt I was facing is can I read enough to make this faithful. Uh, can I can can I be faithful to the literature in this? And so um, that's what I'm trying to do in this case. And so, and then there, then there's a uh, then there's halflings based off of uh, Levin, uh, 
the uh, middle uh, Mesopotamia. That's what I was looking for. Half Mesopotamian halflings who I think they ride goats into battle, and that's as far as I got. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, goats are a good friend. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I, it's funny you said because I think well, as I stand right now, I'm keeping the original three uh races from ODD, but I've changed them pretty dramatically. Like my dwarves are uh completely blind. They're they they are they, they don't have any hair. Well they're hairless for the most part. They they dwell underground. They're basically like uh un, you know ground dwellers, uh underground dwellers. And the elves are based I use the two soul thing. I think I've talked about that before. It's only the halflings I haven't really decided what I want to do. I, I think I thought about just removing them all together, mm-hmm. but I'm not sure. But I, I was I was staying close. But that's pretty cool to to completely just use other right because i've had this conversation with, with people usually hardcore osr people <laughs> which i am i guess uh and they, they would be like well it's not right if it's not halflings elves and dwarves and i'm like but what if arneson and gygax had put goblins and you know dragonborns in the original D, you'd be complaining about hobbits now it's like it's it just happens to be what they were reading at the time right they could have put whatever they wanted so i don't see any reason why you shouldn't put whatever uh, races or species of, of creature in your game that you think suits it. I, I think that's actually just a really good way to do it. Uh, personally, I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of having too many, at least official ones, because I think you get a menagerie thing going on, mm-hmm. but I think having, you know, something that suits your setting is, is really cool. And we'll separate it, right? Like I'm all about playing a giant, you know, that's super cool. Yeah, absolutely. And this, that it's fun. You mentioned that. Cause I remember you, in, when you did your actual play for Winter's Daughter, this act, mm-hmm. this came up because I think everybody was a human to start, but then eventually they made friends with that moss dwarf, and then the then uh, somebody I, for, I forget which player it was, but they they had gotten into the groove, they had gotten they understood what it was supposed to be, how this species was supposed to fit into the setting, into the milieu, and they were able to take that on and take on that mantle and, right. and run with it, and so I. 100% agree with you. And I'm kind of, I'm figuring out how I'm going to fit some of the other archetypes in. And so right now it's just those, uh, the three obvious humans. And then the two, are these human or are they not? We don't know kind of, right. kind of, kind of, uh, options, but then at the same time down the line, you can, you can absolutely introduce more. And so I'm, I'm with you less is more because you can make more out of it. And doubling back to our conversation about uh, books with advanced classes. One of the things that draws me to chain mail, which draws me towards the races class kind of basic approach uh, of the game is you can take the, those classes are based on broad archetypes. You can take the fighting man and turn him into Conan. You can turn him into Farfad. You can turn him into um, uh, Eos from uh Pirates of Darkwater. You had a chance to browse through that DVD, Jason. <laughs> I, I have, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, yeah how'd you like yeah. that? I won't, I won't steal an episode from you if you wanted to hate on it or love on it. But how no. was it? Disappointing buy or was it okay? No, it was good. Yeah, I'm sorry I missed it back when it came out. It's, it's a oh no, you said TV show? interesting. Show. Yeah, it's a, it was a cartoon from the 90s. Oh. I, I get 90s or 2000s. I'm, I'm not sure which. Yeah, um, mid 90s. Mid 90s. Huh. Yeah, but it's it's a it, it's an interesting setting. Yeah, you, you know yeah. some interesting in, characters. It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. In short, the uh, the idea is they there's this kind of dark water. It's a it's this kind of malevolent entity that they can find these magic crystals to drive it back and allow their seafaring uh, th- uh, civilization to thrive. And uh, it came up because we were talking about integrating naval combat or naval adventures oh. into into your home game. And so that was one thing. Uh, uh, I can't tell if that's Maddie or if that's his other dog. No, it's um, Maddie. Hi, Maddie. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah it's sitting here right the, by, the, there it by the Blu-ray player. Yeah, oh, that and, looks uh, familiar. Yeah. It was the most expensive cartoon that the network had done to date, and that's the reason why they didn't finish it. Oh. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was a great, it was a great ambitious project, and when I was a kid, that inspired a lot of stuff, and that is part of the reason that I went with the Phoenician kind of period. One, nobody nobody knows about them because you you hear about assyrians all the time you hear about uh vikings all the time but you don't really hear about some of these other less uh less uh 
historically prolific kind of cultures. And so it's an opportunity to dive into mythologies. And I'm not, I don't like stealing wholesale, but they have some right. cool stuff that they believe in, cool stuff that they do that you can adapt and uh, you borrow. It's uh, you talking about like the Howard, the appendix in the, the Howard milieu. Whenever Robert E. Howard wrote a short story, he spent an absurd amount of time researching, learning about the history. And so Mitra is one of the deities in Howard world that's based heavily off of the Mithraean cult of the, I think, the Roman period. And it was one of the uh, one of the competitors for the uh, Roman pantheon and early uh, early Christianity was this Mithraean Mithraeanism cult. And he he did this he did research like that for all of his stories. And you have these kind of uh, one of the uh, one of the compliments that have been given to him that I've heard from friends is Howard is ju- is real enough that you feel like you're there, but it's weird enough that it's still fun to read. And one of the ways that he did that, I I felt, was by diving into stuff that real people believe that real people did and then building off of that and so you're it's le- it's not an appropriation it's more of an appreciation it's 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 an uh, opportunity to dig deeply into the human the human experience and the human psyche yeah it's and, super interesting and I, i'm a big fan of bronze age stuff i don't think we get enough bronze age you know everybody's got their knights in shining armor you know in D and not like this like i, I love a good bronze age uh uh, uh, setting. So I'm, I'm all about that. I'll be playing that game. <laughs> I don't know enough about it to, 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 I, I picked up a game called blood and bronze. We're going to totally sideways here, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. And I keep meaning to run it because it just looks yeah. so cool. I love, that, I just yeah. love the yeah. idea. Yeah. That's, that's, it's just another, so that's cool, on my yeah. list of things to run one day too. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. so there you go. That's, there's, there's a game recommendation for you guys. <laughs> yeah, blood and Ryan. Blood. Here's uh here's another Kickstarter. I won't oh. bore you with two unboxings, but that uh the, uh, like a year ago, I recommended or I, I I publicized a Kickstarter. I got to interview with a creator who was writing uh, em, uh, ancient or emerging or something empires. I could probably open this and tell you the exact title, but um, I, I want to save it for an unboxing episode. He he delivered back in October um, or maybe earlier than that, but I, I just haven't had a chance to do the unboxing episode. But yeah, it was yeah for his for his system. It was very it's Bronze Age. It's and it introduces uh, some cool some a lot of archaeology a lot of history that he that he went into so i have read the pdf and a lot of a lot of he went through a lot of the layouts the uh the city plans for places like babylon places like ur and you so you can and he he did a lot of research into what did they believe how did they live it's a really fun a very fun set piece so and that kind of doubles back that's a really long way to ask uh talk thinking about halflings uh knowing that the just thinking about the moss dwarf from from your winter's daughter experience moss dwarves have a definitive purpose a definitive niche to fill in the tone is if you're going to include halflings which uh you could or couldn't uh, it's it's uh, i would be happy either way what tone what niche do you think that you could reinforce uh for what what kind of a game you wanted to create to to put them into yeah and i think that's the problem like I don't, I don't think that they really fit with the sword and sorcery type of stuff. That I mean, it's funny how Gygax even says, like, if you want, if somebody wants to play one of these, they can. But they kind of, you know, like they say that in OD and D, they kind of imply you really shouldn't play half like. <laughs> but it, it, I had a player play half like, and actually, although they ended up dying. A halfling with a high dexterity is pretty deadly because because the way I do it, they get everything in short range for them, so they always get a bonus. So as some kind of like a master of hunting basically is where they would probably fall um but i don't know that again i'm up in the air but nobody's currently playing halfling and we're not missing it it's just like nobody's playing a thief that that's what i'm saying it's like i keep thinking should i add this but it's like we've had people who have replacement characters they just play clerics so they play you know magic users so they play fighters and nobody has uh, has been like oh you know i need to play something else right so so i guess that's a good question to ask in, in these games daniel what are you doing around would, would, or I think I knew the answer to this, but so the listeners know, what are you doing around locked doors and traps and, and the traditional thievey things that they've been forced into now that where they get their niche protection, where the reason later editions, your, your, your average character can't pick a lock or, you, you know, disarm a trap. Right. So I have two things. Uh, one is that I actually have gear that does it. Um, so you can, anybody can buy a lock pick and everybody has a chance of doing it. It's based on the gear essentially and i have like a whole 
formula that you can work out. Uh, weirdly, not enough people have bought it. Most people just role play it. Like I was just reading a story. It's actually a Western, but it's funny because we were talking about, you know, giving somebody a lock to pick. Right. But in the in the story, the guy breaks into this house, uh, this place, and he's in a locked room. So what does he do? He bashes the door open. Right. And then he gets to a drawer where he wants to find the papers inside. He looks around and finds a letter opener or a knife and he jams in there and he forces it and breaks the lock. You just explain that. Now, what the advantage of having lock picks is that you could do it quietly and you could do it when nobody knows you did it. Right. But they're certainly not required. And I think that's where it comes down to it. Right. There hasn't been a situation where I've been like, well, there's a locked chest and everybody's like, well, we can't do anything. We don't have a thief. I mean, they just say, oh, well, I take my dagger or my thing and they just bust it open. I mean, that's just how they do it. So that's what's funny. Like you have to kind of trust that your players are going to figure it out. I think that's one of the problems I have when I'm designing the game is I want to almost put too much stuff in it because I'm like, but what if they do this? Well, they'll do the thing they do. And, and what, that's what playtesting is so great. It's like, I, I would have initially I put a thief in, but then I thought, well, do I need to? You could just, I mean, the, the way that od d works, unfortunately, because, it, which is realistic, I suppose, is that if you're going to play a fighter, you're not going to wear leather armor and, you know, I mean, you're, you're just not right. I mean, it, because you, I mean, maybe you would, I, I guess you might have a second set of armor, but if you're going to be in dungeons fighting stuff, you want the best armor you can get. So it's weird that uh, the fighter really wouldn't be the thief. And if you look at the thief in Greyhawk and you look at their advancement, like their fighting advancement and their, uh, their hit dice, they're equal to the magic user. So the magic user is really the thief, right? No armor, they're not carrying a lot of weapons. They're staying back in combat. They, they're fast, right? They can buy the stuff. They can buy the black hooded cloak. They can buy a set of lockpicks. And the magic user becomes your thief. Excellent. Hmm. I had not thought of that. I have done a lot of math hmm. to compare uh, fighting capability of the fighting man and the thief uh, in terms of how much the XP differential was to find out hmm. if, if uh, say, my thief is... And I, if my thief is fighting as hero, how much XP did I have to earn to get there versus a fighting man? And then you, I, I can then consider the difference to be the the value of the skills that he has. But yeah, I, I had not done that for uh, magic user versus thief. So, so that's a that's a very interesting that's a very interesting point. Yeah, well, I well, the other the thing does. Well, oh, go sorry. ahead. Well, well I just noticed the other day when I laid when I laid him down. Sorry. Uh, I know what's that? <laughs> uh, well, well, I was going to say uh, the other thing it Go does. <laughs> now, now we keep talking over each other. The the other thing that it does though is your magic user, especially at lower levels, has X amount of spells, right? A handful of spells, one or two spells, and that's all they have. Where if they're also acting as a thief, that keeps that player engaged even more so. I mean, obviously they can be engaged anyway, but this this allow gives them a, a secondary function which actually may end up being a more primary function if they only have one or two spells. So, yeah. Right, 100%. And if you look at the Thief, they are... Uh, I actually noticed because I opened up Greyhawk the other day, I was just looking at the fighting capability of the Thief, and I was like, I didn't actually put it next to Magic User, but I was like, hold on, I think these are the same. And then that kind of translates as to why the Thief has the D4 hit die and stuff, right? So the Thief and the Magic User are using almost the same advance, but just with different experience points, obviously. So if you think if you were going to make a thief, right, it would use and you were using chainmail, you'd have the same fighting capability as a magic user. The only difference is they could use whatever weapons they want and they could wear leather armor. But for most of the combat, except for man to man in my system, leather armor and no armor is basically the same because I don't have a differentiation. So, again, the magic user could easily become the thief. So if you want to play that thiefy like character, I would play a magic user. Yep, and he has the spare encumbrance to carry the tools, so it makes sense. Exactly. Yeah, and they're fast. And like like my system that I that uh, I was explaining, like when I do like move silent, like having soft leather boots or barefoot helps you. Uh, you know, not not being encumbered, not having a backpack, whatever. So like the magic user can put down their bag and sneak ahead. The fighter's not going to peel off peel off their plate mail, right? <laughs> So uh, the fighter really isn't the thief, and which is funny because that's where I was looking. I was like, how can I make the fighter the thief? But really, it, in my mind, it, I was like, hold on, the magic user is the thief. <laughs> and that's that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. That's why I didn't put a thief in the game. That was the end of that thing where I was walking back and forth and I thought of this. Nice. Yeah. Okay, well, that's what I have. Is there something else? <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay, powerful monsters. I just wanted to go by notes. Mixed parties and scaling, yeah. yeah. So... Yep, scaling scaling is a big thing too that we yeah. have to think about because that I will share. Um, 
I had a, made an attempt to integrate a mass battle in tandem with a uh, dungeon delve and scaling is very important and I can tell you that because I flubbed it I did very poorly uh, to run that game and I, I honestly I, I sent an apology after I started looking at some of the video playback to uh, to my players I'm like oh I uh, I totally I totally flubbed this. This was a bad, and I, I go on record as saying it's not the role of the ref to make sure everybody has fun. But at the same time, um, I did not set the stage for them to have fun. I put them in, I kind of injected them into this mass battle scenario that they didn't have a context into. And I know why I did it. It's just, this was, this was one of the last games I got to run before we life got crazy. But, um, but the, the moral is, um, I feel like I need to go back. And so the original idea was have a battle happening outside that's causing a distraction at this layer. And then the party comes in and does uh, almost a covert ops kind of a thing on the backside. And that was the plan, but I, the execution wasn't there. And so there was, we spent entirely too much time on the mass battle piece. And how mm -hmm. could this have been made better? Scaling. And so one of the things that, that I ran into is I had this line of effectively like 200 guys walking up and then they had waves of things and artillery going off. And, but more importantly, when the enemy cavalry hit, you had um, like nine, I was rolling 96 dice at a time. And that makes sense awesome. if you call it man for man. And I, having played uh, anyone who's familiar with Warhammer, I played uh, Warhammer 40k orcs. So I'm very accustomed to having my brick, rolling them all, picking them all up and then rolling them again, because I have 200 attacks to, to, to resolve this combat. But so this didn't bother me at all. But it dawned on me as we were counting successes, that's slow that's kind of boring and, and moreover i'm having to track casualties on these individual units uh and it's it's slow it's 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 a cognitive kind of balance and so mm -hmm. one of the things that came up in conversation afterwards was scale as because we were um one of one of the uh uh, per, uh, Stephen over at Wargame Culture uh, piped up, and he's a great, great channel. He does a he he runs a uh, AD and D L, uh, low fantasy gaming kind of mashup uh, called, and he, he I don't think he doesn't do a lot of actual plays, but he does a lot. He does a lot of uh, war gaming videos, which are worth kind of worth your time if that's what you're interested in. Uh, he did a chainmail series, which I recommended, which is uh, how how I got to got to know him. But one of the things he pointed out was, well, why are you rolling? a hundred dice when you could be rolling four I'm like why not okay so i had a line of eight units uh up against a line of like three count or three coming in so i'm rolling all these dice when you can scale it down so instead of treating these eight units or these eight things as 160 guys treat them as eight figures roll and I'm going up against um, so say I'm going uh, heavy infantry versus light cavalry instead of rolling a bazillion dice I'm rolling like four and looking for sixes and so that change that does it change the math a little bit uh, so one of the things and this came up because uh, we were talking about the missile fire in troop combat for chainmail where you essentially divide your unit into fire groups and you roll a number of, uh you roll a number of dice proportional to the number of shooters based on the uh enemy armor class and it's not as complicated as i make it sound you just roll and you just roll between one and five dice and sometimes you don't even need to roll at all you're just guaranteed x number of casualties based on this the ratio and it's like, why roll? So you roll these dice and you're either going to do one or zero and you have two chances to do it versus if you roll massive amounts of dice, the average comes out to one. Uh, one or I say one, it comes out to 20. So if you have two units of 20, then you take 20 casualties uh, versus if you have two figures on the table and you take one one off the table, that's the same thing. It's statistically similar. They're not, they're not identical, but it's, it's less load for the table. It speeds up play and it allows you to focus on the part of the game that's more fun. And um, some, some folks, some folks will enjoy that, but uh, some folks will enjoy rolling a hundred dice at a time, but other folks, 
it's it, you, the scale is your friend. And that that's the lesson learned from this long story. No, no and, and it's important to point out here, because we will get a call from, from Joe over at Hindsightless, that the, the people still want to play out, the, the players in this case generally, are, are still people still want to play out these war game scenarios with some tactics and details. Recently, the reason I mentioned that is the scenario you mentioned here with the idea of the PCs going off and doing something while the armies fight is something that we're facing. He's running Wrath of the Righteous, a Pathfinder campaign, which it, it currently where we're at in there, we at, we're controlling an army and in and, and the battles, it, the armies fight and the PCs go off and do a mission. But the armies are very abstracted where it's like a hand, like two or three die rolls and that handles the army combat. And and, yeah. and the point here is that, you, you know, in the games you're running, you, you want the detail of the mass combat in addition to the PC's mission, not just to totally abstract out the army part with the PC mission. So, right. That's what I was going for. Yeah. And I right. wanted to yeah. give, yeah. Yeah, it really depends on what you're going for. And I've actually done both things recently. So I'll talk about it. So when I ran Hyboria kind of for my finale at the end of the uh, the campaign, there was a massive war going on. And Hyboria does one of these like battle system things where you do the math. Like they have this many people, they have a leader. They're, and it's literally just like two roles. And you know how long the combat's going to go and who's going to win and what the casualty rate is before you actually do anything. Then, so this is one way I've done it. So the PCs were doing their mission. And I know, okay, they're going to lose. The wall is going to fall after one hour or whatever. So as they're doing their mission, I just have it narratively happening. I mean, I'm not making it up. It was rolled for. So that's one way to do it, right? So the PCs aren't involved in it at all. I had them make one roll, right? Yeah. It's just happening around them. At, at Gen Con, yeah, Gen Con, I did the opposite. I basically had, I did, I did the dungeon delve first. And then I had them take a break. And when they came back to the table, I ran, literally just ran chain mail. Like it was just like, okay, you've got the magic item now. So you can do this thing. So now you're running your generals. So you're basically running this army. And so they got the tactical part and they got the dungeon delve, but it is literally two different things. I think doing the tactical battle and the dungeon delve simultaneously with the detail of that I was doing with chain mail would have been very, very difficult as you say. And, and, and it's, you know, so if you've got people that want the tactical part, I think you got to just separate. I mean, for me anyways, you just have to separate it as a separate part of the game, even if it's happening simultaneously, right? Probably what I would do is play that part out first because it's easier to, to add to the dungeon delve what is happening outside. Like you just track your time and you know, okay, at this point, this is what happened in the battle. You know, that that's kind of how I've done it and it's worked pretty well. That is a great idea. I will I will plan to do that because it like, like you, like you kind of keyed into is this what the table wants to play? And it's it's important to align expectations. And in in my case, my my players were very gracious with me, but they were more interested in the dungeon delve than they were in the battle. And so, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And in the future, that'll be something to to consider. Have the have the battle happening externally, play it in advance essentially, and then allow the PCs to affect the outcome. So maybe if they if they can. Uh, extract their MacGuffin, or or they can uh, do do whatever their mission objective is, uh, a, uh, attack the lich on the top of the tower, so to speak. If they can do that, then all of a sudden the battle changes. It's like what, what you have this contingency that pops up. So that that's a that's a great idea, and I think that's that's the right way to do it going forward. Um, unless, unless of course you have the players who want to play it out. Right. And, and let's say you've got a group of four players and like one or two are really into the tactical war game part. You could literally just do that on a different day. Like it's a different game. In fact, I've fallen into this thing lately where I, I break my breaking my D and D down into like different games that I play. Um, even in my solo play, I'm doing like a thing where I use outdoor survival to uh, do this mapper thing where they're like looking for the dungeons. And then I go back and I send a party to the dungeon once the mapper finds it. So like I'm literally breaking down the, the, the play into multiple sessions. I think that can actually work really well if you have the group, right? I mean, it could even be one person, right? It could be like you have, it could even be somebody who's not part of the party. Let's say you've got one friend that loves war games that doesn't even play D&D with you. You could literally play with that person and then come back with the results. So I think there's so many options, which is so great. I mean, I think it's a, it's one of the things we have to consider when we're running is that not everybody wants to do everything. And sometimes you can uh, change it up, right? Like, I think that's the thing. Like sometimes you'll get that person that's like, oh, I don't really want to do the tactical big battle i'd rather be the dungeon and you know you so you get that weirdness where you got to kind of be like well all right we won't do that or maybe we'll do it separately i don't know if that makes sense but yep. 
it makes it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But it's super fun. I mean, I, I am not a war gamer. I've said this many times before. I'd never played a single war game in my life until I played Chainmail. So I don't have that background. I find it really fun though, and and I'm I'm super into it. But I know not all my players are, at least not all the time. So it's fun sometimes to just play out the battle. Sometimes I even just do it myself. You know, I'll just play these big massive battles, and then just I have the results. I keep track of it, and we know what happens. So it's just one solution. Jason from the future here. Daniel's about to launch into a talk about using man-to-man in chainmail for a large-scale battle, and that is a prompt from a message I sent him asking him if he wanted to still talk about that during this episode. Back to Daniel. Uh, insofar as just you asking the thing, the man-to-man, um, yeah, I mean, I, so with the man-to-man comment I spoke of, so what I did find was <laughs> when you run man-to-man, so this is going back to the, the – uh, the thing is that I am doing what Taylor's talking about, which is like rolling lots of double D6s. I do find that it is slow and it's definitely a different play. But I also find that generally speaking, this is true of all of this chainmail combat. Once you go through the first round, it's super fast. Because if you're fighting this guy in plate mail and you're using a mace, you know what your number is, right? And once you know that number, once we've gone around once, the next time I go around the table, everybody just rolls their dice, even if it's three sets of dice, right? It's, it's not like they they don't know that, which I think is really nice because uh, – and I'm, the, I'm that kind of DM where I'll just be like, you need this. So they can just tell me if they hit or not. Like I don't need to worry about uh, – so it is much, much slower, but I don't think it was too bad. But what I did learn was I, – I had to give them a little nudge here – was that the players forgot – <laughs> that different weapons are better for different things. And I think I, I think I actually podcasted about this, where one player had a magic sword and he was fighting somebody in plate mail, but he also had like a hammer or something. And like that hammer was way better, but didn't switch because they're so used to using their magic sword, right? So it's like, it, it takes a little bit to be like, you know, you might want to bust out the pole arm here because you're fighting somebody in, you know, in this kind of armor. So it, it definitely is a different mindset. And uh one of the best things that I love about the chainmail with OD and D, but also one of the tricks is because it is so different. It's like all of a sudden you're in a different mindset and the players have to remember, oh, this is a different kind of combat. I have to think differently here. And if your players don't want to do that or aren't into that kind of stuff, it won't be as easy, let's say, to make, make it happen. So I am learning that. Would you mind speaking a little bit, because uh, you mentioned outdoor survival and sending a mapper out to yeah. try to locate a dungeon that the party could then go in. Could you could you elaborate on that a little bit? Like, do or do they have, uh, do they work in cahoots? So they have their scouts and then they have their main party and their, yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, so I'm actually going to do an actual play. Uh, uh, coming into the new year, <laughs> I already started recording. <laughs> so I'm going to do this as an actual play because I found it was really fun. So what I do is outdoor survival uh, without going into the whole thing. They've got different scenarios you can do. One of them is called search. And when you do the search scenario, you turn a bunch of little tokens upside down, chits, and you spread them out all over the map. And one of those tokens is the person that's lost, right? So the, the thing with the search scenario is you just go out there and you try to find that one. And first, you're playing against somebody. So I use that as my baseline. And what I said was every one of those chits is a possible uh, dungeon, okay? So I, so I have the single player start. And they go out to find to basically get to that spot, and they have to leave the map. Obviously, they have to survive, right? I kind of got the idea from the Hateful Place. The, at the back of the first book, they have something called the Mapper, and it's literally like a solo game that you play. But he recommends you just use an actual map and you just move your character around. So what I do is I'll try to break it down as simple as possible. I've added a few mechanics to it. So basically, you move towards the treasure maps. You obviously, if you've ever played outdoor survival, if you don't get food, you don't get water, you slow down and eventually you die. All that's still in play. The other thing I added was from OD and D at the end of each six day period. So after six days, so the seventh day, you have to rest. So I changed that into the wilderness is like the underworld. A person cannot survive. If they, if they reach that time and they're still in the wilderness, they become sucked into the wilderness. They never return. Based on the level of the characters, I have a number of D6s, which count as the days. And that's how many days they're allowed to stay. So higher level characters can stay in the, the dungeon, the, the field longer. So the basic mechanic is I put it down as a solo game. I run my little guy around. He grabs maps and gets off the board, hopefully. Once I do that, I mark on Outdoor Survival where the map is. And I roll in the back of OD&D what the map is. And that will tell me the amount of treasure that the map is to. Then I look at it and I go, okay, this is 5,000 gold pieces. What kind of monster might have 5,000 gold pieces? 
okay, this is the lair of griffins, you know, or whatever. And I'll then make an adventure around that. And the mapper gets 5% of the total value of the map in experience points and half that in money. So basically, because they're selling it, right? So the economy on the other side is the player characters need to buy these maps, which have value. So I'll have maps available to my player characters, which is me, basically. Um, You know, okay, this map leads to 50,000 gold pieces. It's going to cost you whatever that ends up being. It'll cost you 500 gold pieces if you want to buy it from the mapper. And that's kind of how I'm, I'm making the economy work. So it's kind of two games. Does that make sense at all? I probably made it really sound complicated. Yeah, it but. That, that sounds really <laughs> exciting, actually. Because I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm in my, fun. <laughs> oh, were you going to say something, Jason? No, no, I was just agreeing that, yeah, it's, it makes sense. That's yeah, really that sounds really Oh, awesome. I should mention, sorry, one more thing, because this is the most important part of the whole thing. Every time, so Outdoor Survival has a, 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 a what do you call it, a, a standard of play, a steps of play, or whatever they call it, a procedure. So you move, you see if you need food, you see if you found water, you make all your changes, then you roll for a random monster. The, the mapper is unarmed. They are not out there to fight. If you encounter a random monster, I use the evasion rules from od d which are super fun and really good. So you try to, you write down what monsters are there. It might be their lair. If it's a lair, then that's a free dungeon that you can mark down. Um, you then try to evade them. If you do, you just stay where you are. If you don't, you have to run. You know, there's a pursuit rule. So you pursue, do they follow you? If they do, you got to move again. And each time you pursue, I check off one day in the wilderness, which means that and this has happened to my mapper many times. They get they find some griffins or something, and they have to keep running from them, and they run out of time, and they die in the wilderness because they keep getting pushed off the uh, by the by the monster chasing them. So it adds this extra little tension of a. Uh, and the final thing that I added to it was, there's little houses in outdoor survival, like little camps. If you land on a camp and you stay overnight there, so no wandering monster pushes you off, you reset the time for one die. So it allows you to stay out longer if you can get to the camp. So there's a whole strategy to move your guy around. Because if you've ever played, you can't necessarily land on those things on purpose. You have to like, you know, strategize because you can only move so many times and stuff. So, so you can stay out long. Like I, I, when I first started playing it, I had a fourth level guy I just made, and I was able to clear like ten maps off the board. You know, and that sometimes I completely died. So it just kind of depends. <laughs> but I started with the first level character, and I've started to record it. It's funny because they'll get on there, and I'll have like two days left. I'll be like, oh my god, I'm not going to get off the map. You know, and I go, <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, that's fun because that that's a little bit of uh, three hearts, three lambs there also because you have the the concept of chaos as this outside of civilization, and mm-hmm. when the further they go from civilized lands, the weirder things get. Elf land is permanently dark, this kind of weird right. twilight zone, and literally a twilight forever. And then, in order to safely encamp outside of the a veil of civilization or the, the dome of civilization casting light into the shadow, they have, uh, they set up a perimeter of, uh, of law sigils. Uh, I don't remember the exact, it's like, but it's the, the dwarf does it, I believe. So very, yeah, very thematic there. And you got me, yeah. you got me thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm going to, I'll, I'll I'm gonna eventually, like I'm trying to, like I'm still working, play testing, obviously, as I get the thing down, it's going to be like a one page rule set to add to outdoor somehow. So once it's available, I'll make it av- available to people. <laughs> It's super fun. I've I've been really enjoying it. Yeah, so I, that I, sounds cool. I've got yeah. a brain in mind to uh, we we. I think one of the themes that had come up at the end of last last time I was listening to podcast time is really kind of dilating for me. <laughs> but yeah, the last time last time I was thinking about this, the one of the things a lot of folks were talking about was uh, playing multiple characters, having a troop of of characters, and. Uh, and, and one of the things, Jason, you were talking about was having a predefined cast and people coming in to play those cast members, mm-hmm. uh, those party roles, so to speak, uh, rather than being more about. So, yeah, that's bringing me to uh, think about we could you could have uh, talking like we had the um, mass battle. The, the player who enjoys mass battle versus the player who doesn't, you could have a troop, you could have a party, you could play the mapper game with the guy who likes to explore, who likes to run away. You can play the dungeon delver with the, with the party that enjoys the dungeon delving. You could trek your way there. You could build those points of civilization with the domain guy who enjoys that. And on top of that, you have overlap. If someone enjoys multiple aspects, they can run multiple characters. They could do the map game. Then they could come back with their alt, uh, haggle with themselves and pay themselves for the map and then come in and set you send your you, know, you can set up that adventuring guild that I got so much so much flack for hating. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Right. Well, and to be clear, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with player driven guilds. So when when the players and the point is, you want to build that agency, and this is this is a really cool yeah. way to build that agency. So you send your scout party out. Uh, uncover these locations and then you send the uh, the big boys you send the heavy armor out to the you send your your specialists out to try to delve into the treasure trove so that's a great uh, that's a great way to incorporate multiple aspects of the game and kind of encourage uh, multiple avenues uh, of the experience right yeah and, you know oh sorry go ahead Jason. well no all i was going to say is you, you may want to and i know it's a pain in the butt to do but you you may want to incorporate the you know the basic rules they're going to need from outdoor survival in your final document since i i don't believe there's a a legal way to obtain that anymore no and, I, and i've changed it slightly yeah so i'll take yeah. this the basic die rolls kind of like what planet Eris did mm-hmm. i realized as i was looking at that that they basically took the outdoor silo sheet right i just added like a con thing at the bottom which was very clever um the other thing too which is goes back to what taylor was saying so yes that's i will in fact do that mm-hmm. uh, jason good idea um is that one of the first maps that I found, well, it was a, a lair, rather. I found a bandit lair with 189 bandits and the whole blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I'm not going to send a, a party of adventurers to go fight bandit. Then I was like, well, hold on. I could use chain mail, right? And I could have somebody with like, you know, they could hire 100 mercenaries on horses and ride out there and take out the bandits who's got all this treasure, right? So you could literally hire a mercenary group to go raid this bandit thing. So that's the beauty of the game, right? It's not just this oh, well, I'm four adventurers that are leveling up. There could be any num- number of ways you could approach this, which I think is what makes it really cool. Definitely. Yep, yep. limitless yep. possibility. Yep. Which is the advantage of the role-playing game compared to a board game or a computer game or something else where you've got you know restrictions with a role-playing game. It's just up your imagination. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's probably a good place to kind of wrap this up. We've had a a good conversation about an hour and a half here and I, and I want to leave something for when you guys come back, <laughs> but I, I really appreciate your coming on the show. I hope. That, Anytime. Yeah. I appreciate it, you putting up with my, uh, my schedule. So I appreciate you having me. Oh, it's not a problem at all. Um, oh. Anything b- before we leave, anything you would like to, to plug or recommend people check out? Uh, we'll go with Taylor first. Ch- check out, uh, check out play testing. Whatever, whatever you're working on, whatever you're doing, play it, get to the table. And even if you're not working on something, get to the table, because that is where the inspiration comes. It's just like any other skill. It's just like any other ability. The more you do it, the better you are and the more uh, you're going to get out of it. So that's what I'm going to plug is p- play in the game. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a good that's perfect. Uh, I, I really like that. Uh, that attitude. And it's true. The more you mess with things. And also don't feel like you need to stay restricted to what other people have done. You know, take what you got that you've liked and then start adding to it and just, you know, find a willing group, let them know you're testing things. And I found most players are pretty cool if they know that you're just trying something, you know. Uh, And I think that, uh, again, is how we learn. We learn how the game works for us, what we really like in the game. It took me playing a lot of different systems before I figured out exactly where I like. And now I know, which is which is great, you know. Yeah. And I'm going to recommend people check out. There'll be links in the show notes, but check out the communities that are built around both of these gentlemen. You've got, they, they each have their own discord that are slightly different feel, but you know, we're you know, on each other's some, discord too. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say, there is some overlap there. You, yeah. You know, so, but, but yeah, check them out, see if one fits you. Um, and with, with that, I think we'll, we'll call this to a close, but you guys have a great rest of the year. Take care. And I will talk to you soon. It's not video, so I wait for nothing. (laughs) Well, I caught the wave. That's the important. Well, well, that's the important. I appreciate it. Just another way to be the top of the world, hold up one, two,
Never say it, but it's 